Okay, thank you folks, and again, thanks to everybody on C-SPAN. This is quite a panel uh, following, boy, these, the first two panels were excellent. So if you all weren't here, some of you were, but we, you have great, great acts to follow. So uh, let me just briefly go over the people who we have with us today, and then, Peter, I'm going to turn it over to you for the first question. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us. We're lucky to have Jane Harmon, who is now the president and CEO of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Alan Greenspan, the former chairman of the Federal Reserve System. Governor Engler, the head of the Business Roundtable. David Stockman, former director of OMB. And Senator Warner, who is the sitting senator and also one of the gang of six and heavily, heavily involved in this issue. So uh, we're going to talk pretty much about anything you want. As I keep saying, this is really one of these Washington po policy forums where you're welcome to answer whatever question you wish you had been asked instead of what you actually were asked. Uh, and we want to have a rich discussion. But what we do want to focus on is sort of where the politics and the economics of this issue are right now and where they're headed. Uh, and to continue the theme that we've had in the past two panels of going big. And I, I just have to observe that it's been pretty remarkable because I did say if people disagreed with go big, they were allowed to. But across the board, it has been a pretty powerful argument for both the political and economic arguments of why urging and supporting the super committee to come up with a full fix is uh, a useful and almost necessary endeavor. So Peter, over to you. Let me start first of all with the Chairman Greenspan, if I could, the, the economic argument here. We've had a lot of discussion about going big, what the right figure might be. A lot of people have thrown out the $4 trillion figure. From an economic standpoint, what is the right number and how quickly do we have to get there? It's north of $4 trillion. And the reason, basically, is that, as I think everyone in this panel is acutely aware, having the experience of been involved in these various things, that there is a tendency in government to underestimate the size of the problem. And indeed, uh, if you look at the underlying economic assumptions that are being made with respect to uh, forecasts that are made, it's pretty clear at this stage that we are running under and are likely to continue to do so. And that uh, if you fit those data to either CBO's base or anybody's base, uh, you end up with uh, significantly larger deficits. Because remember, when you're dealing with uh, a deficit, which is, remember, very sensitive, to changes in receipts on the one hand and outlays on the other. And small changes give you very substantial changes in the deficit. All of the biases that I can see work in the direction of essentially increasing the size of what we are dealing with. On top of that, we have a very serious problem in that we, are not, we don't have a large deficit which can be collapsed very quickly by uh, discretionary outlays or the end of a war. I, mean, I remember when the deficit at the end of World War II collapsed, and it collapsed largely because the war was over, spending went down. What's driving this deficit is very substantially entitlements. And when entitlements are pushing the deficit, they are very difficult to bring down. Once the country grants an entitlement, it is very difficult to rescind. And I would suspect if I just were to look at just the raw figures, not look at CBO, but just look at what uh, I would internally expect, my judgment is that we are dealing with an issue in which the actual growth in the gross domestic product or any of the other measures of potential revenues uh, is essentially running into a problem uh, which I don't think we've confronted before, namely a significant slowing in the rate of growth, largely because we are taking the most productive people in the economy and retiring them. And they will be around for quite a substantial period of time, receiving benefits. And the people who are in the cohort that's coming in to support, to replace them, are the, these are the students who did so poorly in 1995 and since on those international exams. So the combination of a significant slowing in the working age population and therefore in the civilian labor force, and even putting in reasonably uh, optimistic productivity numbers adjusted for the fact 
uh, that uh, the cohorts are changing within this, in the labor force gives us a set of data which gives me a figure that is possibly five, six trillion dollars to close. And uh, this is a pretty substantial margin that I think that we must have to work with. Dave Stockman, former budget director, someone who's weighed in on these issues. You were pretty outspoken even earlier. The chairman just told us five to six trillion dollars should be the appropriate target for this super committee, deficit reduction over 10 years. How do you get there? What's your mix? I'll see is six and raising four. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think this is a huge problem that is really being underestimated. And I want to say why, but before I do that, I want to, oh, is this on or it's not on? Okay. Uh, before I do that, I want to thank uh, Charlie Cope for recommending my book, uh, Triumph of Politics, that I wrote in 1986. I don't know if it's any good, but when I, got, uh, when I was run out of town on a rail, I did write a book. My publisher gave me 800 copies to distribute to my friends. I still have 795 copies left. <laughs> so uh, if anybody needs one, uh, I have a lot of books and very few friends. I'll take one. <laughs> I'll take one. Um, I think this 10-year thing is really uh, causing us to play a numbers game, to get lost in a miasma of numbers that is resulting in we're losing track of how serious this problem is. Because we talk about go bigger. I, I agree. Go bigger, go sooner. But whether you're doing a one and a half trillion or four trillion, remember that's against the 10 year baseline, if you can see that far in the future, which is $200 billion. So we're asking, should we cut the deficit by 1% of that 10 year uh, baseline of GDP, or should we cut it by 2%? When the fact is we've been locked into eight to 10% of GDP deficits for the last four years. When the fact is our GDP has been growing since the recover or the recession ended in June 09 at 44 billion a quarter we've been or a month we've been borrowing 100 billion a month and there's no let up to an equation in which we're borrowing at twice the rate at which GDP is growing. So if you look at a realistic view going forward that GDP has only grown 1.5% annually in the last 11 years, that the non-farm payroll number today, 131 million, is the same number we had in January 2000, that the manufactured industrial index today in August is the same as it was in 2000, that our economy hasn't grown for 10 or 11 years at a time when the Fed still had money to print, which it doesn't now, when we still had a lot that we could borrow and run deficits that we can't now, that when we had a housing market that was booming that is busted now, if you put all those things together, then the outlook going forward is far worse than what's in the CBO baseline. The underlying problem is at least 10 to 15 trillion if we do nothing. And yet we have one party saying no taxes, the other party saying don't touch Social Security, and both parties say to the military industrial complex, we need a defense budget in this world that's 80% bigger than Eisenhower left when he warned about the military industrial complex in 1961. So I would say, Alan is right, five billion, but it's really 10 billion. <laughs> On that note, Senator Warner is a sitting <laughs> member of Congress. I don't know if you want to run for the Virginia Hills after hearing all that or not. The political reality of trying to get anything done in this environment, I know you've been working both Democrats and Republicans to talking about going big, the reality of trying to get there. Well, first of all, you know, great panel. No, I have a guillotine. Um, great panel. Thanks for, for Maya and all her work. Um, these numbers can become so overwhelming. They get moved into paralysis. We should at least all agree that what we did and even the the process we set up, which has got some very good things in it, uh, in terms of this, the so-called super committee, um, you know, let's not set the bar so high that we, that if we do actually get that four trillion, that we, you know, once again, say it's not a, 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 a some level of a success. Number one, number two, there are a group of people up here. Uh, a ever-growing group. As a matter of fact, we had 38 of them last week, 26 of them uh, standing up together publicly. They are maybe the only voluntary group of bipartisan folks in the whole town 
willing to say, yes, tax reform that generates revenues, entitlement reform that maintains the sustainability of these programs, building on great work that a lot of folks in this room have already done. We're all in in terms of supporting um, the super committee. And the, as a relative new guy up here, I think the, the process the process ability of the super committee to kind of forge a grand bargain and kind of do this not in a sequential basis but do it in that kind of one uh, mother of all votes is something that we would be really remiss if we didn't give it our all over the next few months. And we do need, you know, uh, I, can, I can give I've got my own PowerPoint in terms of how deep the hole and what we've got to do. Um, but we kind of know the frame of the, pro of the problem. We're going to have to deal with revenues. We're going to have to deal with entitlement. We're going to have to deal with the defense. We're also going to have to have a growth agenda in here because we can't cut our tax our way out of this entirely as well. We ought to be able to demonstrate that we can walk and chew gum, and that means do some short-term you know, uh, stimulate efforts in terms of, of uh, uh, growing the economy because as, as both of the both the chairman and and talking just mentioned you know, I've looked at all those numbers in terms of where the GDP is where productivity is which is coming back up but those economic numbers are, or employment numbers are still so low and say short-term growth with medium and longer term real deficit reduction and one of the things that we built upon for example the very good work of the Simpson Bowles was real enforcement mechanisms because one of the things that happens is you know, nobody believes when Congress acts that they're going to actually enforce what they say. We've got to put some real hooks into that. But I would argue as well that we need everybody's, everybody's oars in the water at this point. This will not happen uh, unless the business community, the political community, the, the budget thinkers all kind of agree that we're going to do help this super committee get to this bigger number. And candidly at this point, and there's one last quick comment, I'm sure we'll get back around. You know, the margin's 10% on either side, to my mind, and I feel very strongly about some of the things, but I'd be willing to move on those margins to get an agreement. I think one of the biggest single things, <coughs> one of the things that was so self-inflicted in what we did to our economy at the end of July, beginning of August, is um, both from the business side and from the individual consumer side, People who are uncertain, we just put an extra dose of uncertainty and, oh my gosh, if our political leadership can't even put a plan together to balance, long-term balance our books, then I'm going to cut back whether I'm a business person or consumer in terms of spending. I think one of the best things we can do for job growth right now is get this at least $4 trillion real enforceable plan in place. And, but, you know, but if everybody says, well, it's got to be my way or the highway approach, we're not going to get there. And I'm actually out relatively, I'm much more optimistic today than I was at the beginning of August. That leads me to Congresswoman Harmon. You're a few months removed from your time in Congress. Your arm's length the view now of what's taking place here. You as optimistic as Senator Warner, or are you more skeptical? Um, I, I want to be optimistic. I'm impressed that Mark is optimistic since he's been hitting his head against a wall for the last uh, the six months while I've been luxuriating at the Wilson Center. But let me, let me make a few points. First of all, I'm not an economist, obviously. I'm just a, a recovering politician. So, so I'll start with this quick story, which is that some of you will remember Andy Stern anyway. Well, that I ran for governor of California at the end of the 90s. And someone came up to me and said, how big are you? And I said, big enough to run for governor of California. I think the question is, how big is Congress and the president uh, in terms of this issue of going big? And I want to point out that Congress and the president were big enough in the 90s to do these things. Uh, I was there. So was John Spratt. So was Dave McCurdy. Um, I think Mark was not there. Mark was doing productive things elsewhere. Uh, but we were there, and I made the tough vote. I don't know how Dave voted or John did. Uh, for the Clinton budget in 1993, my first term, which was a career-threatening move, I, I came back to Congress by a margin of 800 votes out of uh, 225,000 cast, and most of the women elected with me in 92 to open seats lost their elections. Marjorie Margolis-Mesvinsky was the poster woman for this. 
Uh, I also was one of the hearty little band of 40 in the Penny Kasich uh, conspiracy, uh, 20 Democrats and 20 Republicans, where we proposed to cut $100 billion from the budget, and we came within four votes of getting that passed. $100 billion in, in today's terms it would be substantially larger. Came within four votes of passing that against the objections of the White House and most moving parts of the then Clinton administration. And I also, of course, was part of the large bipartisan group to, to vote to balance the budget in 1997. That was only 14 years ago, folks. And look what happened. Uh, it's a question of are we big enough or are our elected leaders big enough to do this? They used to be bigger. And something happened. And uh, I, I think uh, at, at risk is, uh, you know, not just our short-term future, but whether America remains a superpower, whether America is in the top tier of countries in the world. This is, these stakes are huge. So what do I think is, is possible? I don't know if I'm as, as uh, optimistic as Mark, but I did write an op-ed piece with um, Vin Weber a month ago. We were in the same place talking about this problem and said exactly the same thing. So we decided that between us we had 15 terms of service in Congress and we would write a joint op-ed which says, politics aside, debt solution clear. And our point was that the president could request Congress to introduce on a separate track from the Budget Committee, no offense, um, Bowl Simpson or something close enough to that, plus an infrastructure bank or some short-term jobs funding mechanism, but infrastructure bank, uh, which has been a very popular idea with both parties, seemed to fit the bill because it would generate jobs fastest. And that could proceed using the regular order through the committees of Congress, hopefully uh, putting pressure on the budget committee and involving more members to help them get to the right result. So uh, am I optimistic that this could happen? I'm disappointed that it isn't happening. I'm disappointed that the president didn't ask for this in, in, in January after his commission heroically came up with a grand bargain that is at least the bones of where we ought to go. And I'm disappointed it, it couldn't be done by the president and John Boehner in the summer. And I'm disappointed that it isn't uh, being done now, and I just would close with, uh, I hope everyone, it's probably been mentioned in prior panels, everyone's read the Tom Friedman piece uh, today, but he says, we can either have a hard decade or a bad century. And so I, I'd like to vote for the hard decade. Governor Engler, you have a unique perspective as a former governor. Someone obviously represents business interests here, the CEOs uh, that you represent. Are there oars in the water to quote from Senator Warner on this issue? Well, I think there's no question that they are, and uh, they used the example earlier today. We just concluded a business roundtable meeting, and Maya was kind enough to come down and spend a fair amount of time just walking through some of the options that are in front of the, the Congress and in front of the nation. And uh, there, there's a lot of interest. And, and uh, you had CEOs saying, oh, and by the way, this isn't a short period of time because when you had 20 percent, 30 percent drops in revenues in companies, they had to act, and they didn't have they didn't take it over a few months or a couple of years. You had, to, you had to start making decisions tomorrow morning, and you had to make some by the end of that day and the next day, and you, you got at it. The other interesting point is around the country today, there are examples in both parties, governors, Democrat or Republican, uh, with legislative bodies, in some cases split control, in some cases the opposite party, in some cases their own party, and they've all been making decisions to balance their budget and some of the uh, the magnitude of the cuts are on the order of what Governor Warner faced when he first took office in Virginia or what I had waiting for me back in, way back now in the old days of 1991 in Michigan. So, so they've had to step up. I mean, it's, it, it is a proportion, and I think Dave Stockman captured it. Is it a 1% or 2% you know, a, a, you know, over a period of time, a, a decade? It, it, it seems to me that this is also in going very big here, an opportunity for a great deal of creativity. I mean, it's got to be a legislator's dream to get a one up, you know, up and down vote, no amendments. Uh, that just never happens in this world in Washington. You couldn't get really that to happen in the state legislature very easily. But so the idea that you can put one thing and that argues just screams for a very large package because the bigger it is, uh, the tougher it is to vote against. If it's the solution, you, you don't want to go small. You want to go uh, humongous uh, because it's just impossible to vote against at that point. 
And yes, there will be lots of things that people won't like, but there will be much more that they will like. And the beneficial effect of acting is what carries the day. Um, and I, I actually think we ought to probably be thinking about, since we ever pass budgets on an annual basis, maybe part of the work of the special committee would be give us a budget, an annual budget for each of the next 10 years yep. at, a, at some, some baseline amount. And in certain agencies, I'd be saying that ought to decline each year, but they know for 10 years it's going to decline. So they, the good managers that we've got, the professionals of the bureaucracy can manage that over time. They can do it through attrition, consolidation. I'd probably also in the special committee give the president unlimited reorganization authority to get the 19th century structure into the 21st century uh, so that you could use the, the technology and capture that as another way to drive what at least the chairman of IBM has said could be as much as a trillion dollars out of cost uh, when you take, say, 5,000 data centers and take that down to maybe the 50 you really need. Uh, I mean, you, you, you just, I mean, there is so much opportunity here. It's like a target-rich environment, but nobody's in charge, and the special committee has an opportunity to tee it all up. Now, somebody's still got to execute, and that's what elections are for, but, uh, you know, once the responsibility is fixed, the direction is set, I, I, either somebody will step up or there'll be somebody new to step up, sort of the way it'll work. And, and, and I think there are models at state level. I think there are models in some companies. So Washington can do it. So let me pick up on the sort of theme of, of going big in the way that some of you are talking about. Before we start making go big from four trillion in savings to 10 and 20 trillion in savings, which is where I'm worried we're headed. Um, I also think there's the real benefit of thinking about going big in bringing other pieces into this, right? This is a chance to make debt reduction an economic growth strategy. And that means there's a space for a jobs component. There's a space for regulatory reform. There's a space for a whole lot of things that contribute to economic growth along with debt reduction. And one of the things we know now from the work of Rogoff and Reinhardt, and there was a new paper presented by Steve Cicchetti at Jackson Hole about the fact that where we are at debt levels right now is probably already a drag on economic growth, right? So if you put in place a multi-year sensible debt reduction plan, that can be part of a pro-growth strategy. And we talked about this a bit in the first panel. If you do the tax reform right, if you do the entitlement reform right so that you protect investments and, and scale back on consumption, um, if you do it in a way that creates certainty, and I think this point about multi-year budgets, putting in place a budget that people can count on for a number of years can really help a business-led recovery, which I think is the key to getting out of, of the downturn where we are right now. And if you put in place a plan that leaves this fiscal space at front, up front so that we can continue the recovery, that all is something to gain. So I guess I would like the panelists to weigh in on how debt reduction or debt consolidation can feed into an economic growth strategy but also separately, because if we're going big, we can put other policies into this. What is the most important pro-growth policy, hopefully that doesn't make the deficit worse, that you think should be part of a package? Whoever wants to jump in. Certainly, Chairman Greenspan. Uh, the one thing which we, we know is that uh, the number of endeavors on the part of various countries to rein in deficits of this type of problem that almost everybody in every study that I've seen indicates that uh, the endeavors that are essentially implemented by sharp reductions in spending have been far more successful in solving the problem without maximum problems with respect to the economy. The IMF, for example, which did the largest study indicated that uh, to be sure both tax increases and expenditure cuts will tend to cut the level of economic activity. But the difference between the two is very large. And the more interesting issue, which we don't know the answer to, is, and this is where the Bowles-Simpson initiative, I thought, was really very clever, going to tax expenditures. The issue is, what will a very large reduction in tax expenditures due to economic activity. If it behaves more like outlays, which I suspect it would be, then the impact of that trillion dollars, a little over trillion dollars, that we have there annually uh, is uh, potentially a very important beginning to get at this particular problem. 
And uh, I think the governor is raising a very important issue when he says that when you do it big, uh, there are more ways in which people can agree with it than if you have a very specific single issue in which there are innumerable people who are against it. But uh, there is another factor out here which we can't disregard. It's called the bond market. When I was originally asked when uh, Simpson and Bowles as chairman before the committee's report came out, uh, I was asked uh, what uh, I, th I thought the possibilities of Simpson Bowles essentially setting the framework for deficit deduction. And I said something like the Simpson Bowles uh, initiative will pass the Congress. The only question is, is whether it is before or after a bond market crisis. And we can stand here or sit here and argue whether or not we're dealing with a large number or a small number. But we have to ask ourselves, what would we do if all of a sudden the markets began to erupt negatively, on thinking that the Congress in this country is incapable of coming to grips with a problem of this size? And I hesitate to think what the consequences could be, and I hate to think what the politics would be. Yes. Well, um, in I think it was 2008, uh, Los Angeles passed a ballot measure by a vote of about uh, at least two thirds to raise taxes, to raise sales taxes by half a percent to fund uh, infrastructure build out in Los Angeles for uh, mass transit, light rail, and um, um, maybe uh, I think that was essentially what it was. And that measure has been generating revenues for the last three years. Los Angeles has proposed that it be able to front load that build out uh, by borrowing money in an infrastructure bank or in some other mechanism um, to build out in 10 years what that tax measure would fund in 30 years. And by doing that, it would build, it would generate hundreds of thousands of jobs in the short term. I'm telling this story because people, including Republicans, voted to tax themselves to deal with the transportation meltdown in Los Angeles in a way that would, one, solve that problem, and two, solve the huge unemployment problem at the same time. And therefore, um, if there were some form of infrastructure bank, not necessarily funded with new revenue, Alan, but funded with repatriated earnings or you know, pick a flavor, funded somehow, uh, that could help a city like Los Angeles uh, get in the game of uh, building transportation jobs fast and solving its problem. I think that would be a huge win. And the other point about the story I just told is the government or somebody would be paid back because this, this sales tax uh, is, is generating the revenue to pay the government back. So this isn't a, uh, a handout. This is a, uh, a way to accelerate something that voters in, in a large metropolitan city have, have decided uh, they need. Senator. Well, yeah. I'll just, um, and Jane, I, I agree with the infrastructure bank. Matter of fact, it's uh, the original three co-sponsors of the not grant version, but the one that uh, the Chamber and Labor agreed on, I think John has been supportive as well, was a uh, less about grants, more about loan guarantees, it was Kerry Hutchinson and I. So I think it's one of the tools, although I do think a lot of these tools are kind of around the edges. We've used our big bullets, we've used monetary policy, we've used fiscal stimulus, so what can we do around the edges? Um, I, I get a little concern on these kind of panels that we, we can spiral into a pretty dark place pretty quickly. <laughs> and uh, Jane, your comments earlier about, yeah, there have been times bashing my head against the wall, but you know, what is the choice? You know, is our rallying cry going to be in America, at least we're better than the EU? <laughs> Greece. Uh, no, I'm <laughs> saying, I'm, thinking, I'm more generic, not just Greece. I'm thinking the, you know, in terms yeah, of political uh, stepping right. up, and I, I, this is why I gotta make, you know, the, the appeal, I, you know, John and I were governors and we both struggled with challenges. We, you know, we made a lot of hard cuts and I agree with John, uh, Governor Engler completely. But also in Virginia with the two to one Republican legislature, we raised revenues. Mm -hmm. 
and we got named the best managed state, and we got named the best state in the whole country for business. So I do hope we need to go big, but before we layer on this super committee, which has got a bogey at this point of 1.2 to 1.5, and I would like to see as many additional things added on as possible, but if they only get five of the 20 that we want to add, recognizing that if they're going to get a score, they've got to be done almost in five or six weeks, you know, let's, let's do what is you know, the $4 trillion number everybody said is at least as a minimum. I would agree with the speakers, we need to do more. But if we take that step, do it in an enforceable way, do it in a way that shows the political leadership and the political class in this country can actually work together on something, and the point that I would say is a, as a relative still newbie up here, uh, it won't get done unless the governors, the state legislators, the business leaders, the thought leaders all are willing to kind of give a little and say, with this super committee, if you step out, we got your back. Dave Stockman? Well, I, I think the reason we're not going big, we all agree, and I don't mean to say four billion isn't enough. That would be a godsend if we did it. Trillion. But the trillion. Trillion. trillion, excuse me, billion an hour. Right. Okay, <laughs> we actually, you know, we spend a half a billion an hour. Right. right? Okay. So, uh, the point is, there are too many people in this town who don't believe that it's real or necessary or urgent, and it's evident in their behavior. And, and part of the reason for that is they believe things that aren't true. One of the great statesmen who sat in this room for many years was Pat Moynihan. And he said, everyone has a right to believe whatever they want to, but they don't have a right to their own facts. And we have a lot of people who believe things that aren't facts. And one of them on the Republican side is you can't raise taxes in a weak economy. Well, I'm sorry, we're going to have a weak economy for years and years, and if we don't raise taxes, we're going to stay in this hole. In 1982, the unemployment rate was 10.5 percent. We were in a very bad recession. There wasn't necessarily light at the end of the tunnel. And Ronald Reagan signed the, the, the TEFRA Act of 1982. That was worth 1.1 percent of GDP of tax increases in the next two years. That's the equivalent of $150 billion a year in today's size of economy. So the fact is the history shows that you have to pay your bills. And if you don't like the economy because it's a little too weak to suit your fancy or because it hasn't been going anywhere for 10 years, which is true, that doesn't give you the right to keep hitting the credit card until some economist tells you it's okay, this, we've had a business cycle recovery, now we can start getting real about the deficit. The recovery's already happened. We are now in the permanent state of our economy. It's growing at 1% if we're lucky. And so we have to deal with that fact. And if we keep doing stimulus after stimulus after stimulus, we're just get, creating a cliff. You know, right now, there's $500 billion worth of tax uh, reductions that will expire in 2013-14. Right now, the baseline says the safety net's going to go from 400 to 300 billion a year uh, in a year or two. So the fact is, we've got 3.5% of GDP cliff that we're going to smack right into year after year, unless we get started on it now, because they're not going to allow all these tax cuts to expire. They're not going to allow all these programs to expire. And when you get back into the heat of trying to put that stuff into some kind of reasonable order, you're going to not get very much deficit reduction done. That's the problem. This cliff, it is huge. It is $600 billion a year, ready to hit us in 2013, 2014. So if they don't do it now, we're going to be <laughs> in a, in, we're going to be a fly on the windshield of that cliff uh, when we get to 213. The energy speech not given is kind of right at the top of my list because uh, we used to kind of shy away and be a little nervous about saying energy independence for America. Today it's actually within our grasp if we think about it with what's happened with shale discoveries, with the improvements in the geology and the ability to, to find uh, resources off our shores. So you'd You'd, you'd want to, as part of this remake of the government under our, our budget balancing and cutting, uh, have a true energy department, but that would be an energy uh, exploration and production department, and you'd, you'd get serious about, about exploration. Um, and I'm very happy this past week they finalized the air quality permits for Shell off Alaska. Uh, uh, there's tremendous resources there, we believe. 
uh, I think we're going to have to redo our nuclear uh, base. We've got 20 percent of our electricity today comes from nuclear. Those plants are going to start aging out. So that we need to get that sorted out. Um, and then while we're making decisions, and I'll, I'll just run through a couple of things on the list. You would, you would uh, have FERC and figure out uh, on transmission lines today, just the, power, the kilowatts we generate, we lose anywhere from 5 to 8 percent of those in transmission. There's a wonderful business plan and ROI if we just upgrade all the existing transmission. Without building, we need to build new, and that's a different story, and you need permits for that. But for heaven's sakes, where you've got transmission lines, you ought to be able to upgrade. A lot of jobs, and you can't do those offshore. That's all work here. Uh, the other thing you'd probably do if you're doing energy efficiency at the same time is in every public building in America, whether it's owned by the federal or the state governments or local governments or schools, uh, there, since we're going to probably keep those in the public sector for a lot of years, you would actually complete all of that. That's something Bill Clinton's talked a little bit about, but makes perfect sense. Again, thousands of jobs there. Uh, if we were actually doing the oil and gas exploration, since those royalties aren't in the budget because they've never, they've never been scored, I'd probably do some reservation of some of that, and I'd do the entire Mississippi River Basin and get those locks dams upgraded with some of the royalties. I'd get that big pipeline built from Alaska. More royalties come off of that. I'd probably open up another million or two acres of federal land, use some of those royalties to upgrade all of our national parks uh, so that we've got tens of millions of people go there and they all need work. Um, you know, and, and so that's just, that's my energy speech. Uh, I'd also, if I move over to one other one, $30, $40 billion project, no public funds needed for the next generation air traffic control system that is a, is a you know, quadruple win or, or more. It's, it's energy efficient, it's less polluting, it's less hassle, uh, and it's an export potential for us, and it's a high tech to boot. I'd probably fix the export controls because our study says $60 billion of stuff we could sell to other places in the world as opposed to letting the, the British, the German, the Japanese, and our allies sell it. So, I mean, that's just to get us warmed up. All of these are administration. Uh, introduced ideas, but they've gone nowhere in three years. This is the time if you want to deal with a 9% unemployment rate. And as I said, I didn't get into Dodd-Frank, I didn't talk about education, didn't talk about health care, and I didn't even get into really regulatory reform. So it's we're just getting warmed up. We've created the billions fruit. of jobs here. Uh, I mean, you, suggest, you suggested that's all low-hanging fruit. Let me just ask I mean, you. That is low-hanging no, 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 I think we have to let the uh, senator make one quote. I've got to make one quote because i got to, go, you know, Gotcha. I've got to go make sure we actually get some of these, these trade agreements through, too, right now, yeah. which, which is another piece of this. And, you know, and a lot of what John's talked mm -hmm. about, one of the only Democrats looking at offshore off of Virginia. I, I would take on the, the, inter, the conservation piece on the public buildings and say, if you've been on unemployment, especially youth beyond X period of time, you know, you can finance that retrofitting of those buildings and you could train up. And use the revenue stream from unemployment for in that youth category. None of this to put it to work. There's a whole series of things that we can do. But I got it. But we also have to acknowledge, and one of the ones that drive me crazy with the FAA bill, you know, when every bill becomes a all or nothing for one side or the other, and every operation of government in terms of continuing becomes a potential shutdown nightmare, we do an enormous disservice to this country. And while we can go through the litany of all our proposals, none of them, many of them are bipartisan. I got, I've got a reg reform that I'm working on with Senator Portman that I think that would, uh, uh, which is actually copying some of the things the Brits have done. We call it regulatory pago. They call it one in, one out. You know, but until we can deal with this debt overhang, until we can show that the political leadership in the country can actually get something done, we got to restore some level of confidence, as everybody has said, and we can go dark. We can talk about the old days, we can talk about how big the problem is, or we can take this next three months, two and a half months, and say we're going to be all in helping the super committee, and then have a plan B if they're not successful. But first thing is, we got this opportunity, and let's not have another one of these sessions you know, in January talking about what we didn't do when we had this opportunity, as John said, to have that one major vote where at the end of the day if this isn't if this vote didn't you know you're either for the country moving forward or you're for more paralysis we can't frame it that way it cannot be one democrat versus republican and the only way we'll get to that kind of vote is if everybody here gets their oars in the water and frankly more than the way they did in the last debate thank you i'll go vote and
let you guys solve the rest of the problems. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Mark is, Mark is right, but um, if the campaign of 2012 has started, then what comes with that is that you get more bang for the buck if you blame the other guy for, solving, for not solving the problem than if you work with the other guy to solve the problem. Both parties do this. They play the blame game. And what's wrong with that picture is we don't solve problems, and Congress has shrunk in its ability to solve problems. In the 90s, we solved this problem. Now it's unsolved or, or back, and, and I, you know, it's the incredible shrinking Congress. So how does that turn around? The way it turns around is with a few people who have the guts to say doing this right, going big, is more important than getting reelected. And I think if one person would do that, uh, and I, I certainly salute Mark for his courage, and, and his message. Um, but if a few people would do this, let's pick some from each party, maybe that could start turning around this, this terribly broken and destructive paradigm. I actually thought John's list was good, the growth agenda. I'd just like to put out there my thought, uh, not in terms of static versus dynamic scoring, again, I'm the non-economist here, but in terms of the dynamic nature of the economy. If we had a growth agenda, that might need some, some, you know, a little jump start here. At the same time as we're trying to do a responsible uh, deficit reduction plan, then we end up with faster deficit reduction, more confidence, and we retain our leadership. So it seems to me we ought to have that. I just wanted to add a couple things on John's list that I think are important. Maybe this is as a Democrat. I, I'm not against resource exploration, but I think clean energy is a way under. Uh, underused idea here, not just clean energy in the United States, and there are lots of ways we could develop clean energy, including switchgrass and solar and a lot of things that won't f fill our energy picture. I'm one who does believe in nuclear energy, so I'm not saying this is the only answer. But clean energy exports are something we could really be doing. Why are we letting China do this and, and sitting on our hands? Uh, we know a lot about this, and if we could ramp up the industry and, for example, take our largest consumers of, uh, largest federal purchasers of automobiles, uh, I think DOD, and, and make their fleets cleaner, we would drive a market in developing um, uh, mass producing cars and other things cheaper that could generate strong exports. So that's one. The second one we haven't mentioned is immigration reform. It makes absolutely no sense to have Caltech graduates, you know, geniuses, in science and engineering um, uh, leave uh, because our immigration laws won't let them stay in this country. 50%, I think, of the graduates from Caltech and there are other schools in this boat uh, have to leave our country immediately upon getting the best education on the planet. Export controls have to be changed. And yes, we do have to pass fair trade agreements. It makes no sense to deny ourselves access to other markets and deny their access to us. Uh, it also is a good national security agenda to have trade with countries rather than war. Chairman Greenspan, if I, if I could pick up on the economics here, and, and again, if the super committee comes to, to you and asks your advice for the ultimate plan that they must consider, if they ask you about the mix, what's the appropriate mix? You've outlined how, what the target should be for them. How do they get there? What would your advice be to them? Be? Well, I first would say that uh, uh, what I think probably where uh, Mark Warner's views of people converging is going to occur uh, is not where I would start if I had my choices. But I know my view of what ought to be done uh, will get maybe one vote, which would be mine, and I'm not sure I'd vote for it myself. <laughs> uh, but I do think that uh, I think the president has indirectly acknowledged that he made a mistake in not addressing Bull Simpson when it came out. It was an ideal time. And uh, in my judgment, the, the, where we ought to go is basically to take Bull Simpson, which is, uh, I think, a very cleverly constructed uh, bipartisan approach to coming to grips with this problem. And as I said before, it has one extraordinarily clever part, which 
None of us, for reasons I do not understand, have really approached which is the tax expenditure part of this issue. I mean, tax expenditures are a trillion dollars a year. And uh, I would do basically what they do, which is you start off with the assumption that all tax expenditures are gone. And then you have to negotiate up a few items that would, would come into place. And I don't think, unless you do this, that we're going to get anywhere near to a solution. First of all, there is no way to solve this problem without significant economic and political pain. If we're going to try to do this on the cheap, meaning no pain, it'll fail. Or it'll be a whole series of uh, budget gimmicks, which we've all seen over the years. So I would say at this stage that the quickest way to come to grips with this problem is to take Bold Simpson. They got a very detailed document. I was very impressed with how much that commission did in such a short period of time. And uh, you could take that and put it uh, with a little work at OMB and CBO and a variety of other places. Uh, you can get every little item. Uh, I don't think they did a full line item in Bold Simpson, but we're close, they're close to it. So there's a budget out there which, as the governor says, you can vote up or down. <clears throat> we ought to find out whether Bull Simpson has got the votes. If Bull Simpson doesn't have the votes, then I despair at where this country is going. And I despair, incidentally, because what's at stake here, and Jane would know far more about this than I, is the status of the United States and the world. Uh, I mean, there are a few little things that are going on. Uh, uh, studies which take a look at the military, for example, find that uh, our whole infrastructure is deteriorating. The average life uh, that uh, I think a committee that Norm Augustine headed indicated that uh, a, a very significant part uh, of our uh, military infrastructure is very old, and I think he gave me a number which I couldn't believe, I still can't believe. The average age of equipment of the American military is 50 years. Now, I find that non credible until I look that there are B 52 uh, C bombers still in operation. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and so the question then gets to, into budget terms is. What does it require? Let's assume for the moment, and I, I, I grant you this is not a valid assumption, of restoring the existing military. We have, a, we have a military which is built up during the Cold War to fight the Soviet Union. And that's not what we would need going forward. But to just to build up to where we were would require hundreds of billions of dollars to bring the, uh, the technology uh, up to something uh, which, in my judgment, represents where this country should be and is. Uh, I'm looking at the negotiations that are going on about with, with respect to the Middle East today. And uh, I've never seen the United States in a more uh, lowered position diplomatically. And there's no way of differentiating the budget in this whole budget conference from the status of the United States as a world power in the years ahead. John Engler and Dave Stockman, I was hoping to get you all, Dave Stockman, to, to weigh in on what the chairman is talking. He talked a little bit about the, the zero option that Bowles Simpson talked about, a trillion dollars, getting rid of those tax expenditures, maybe moving up from there. You talked earlier about all the sacred cows out there. How's that going to play out? Well, I mean, it's a huge sacred cattle farm is what it is. I mean, it's, it's just not going to happen as a way of getting revenue into the coffer. It might be a good idea for economic policy for the long run, but for what we need in the middle term, it is just going to be a massive political conflagration that will do no good. Now, the second thing I want to say is economic growth is a wonderful thing, just like Art Laffer said it was. But it has little to do with budget discipline and hard choices and the sacrifices and the pain that has to be distributed. And growth is going to be what it's going to be. It ain't much and there's not much Washington can do about it. 
and what Washington has been trying to do about it is pathetic. A $200 billion payroll tax holiday for one year so people can buy more Happy Meals that they shouldn't have and coach bags that they don't need? Please, give me a break. More money for green energy so we can get another half billion dollar loss in one company like Solyndra that we just saw go down the tubes? Yes, this is fine stuff, but this is how we got into the mess we're in. We've got to swear off stimulus and growth uh, management because there's no agreement on how to get it. Take the facts that are dealt by the economy, take the real numbers that are out there, and figure out how to distribute the pain. That's really what the job is, and everybody wants growth today and pain in the by and by, and we're never going to get to the pain, and as a result, we're going to have, I think, a huge uh, bond market upset, as Alan said. One of these days, when they finally wake up, that uh, our governance uh, system is paralyzed. How much time do we have? Uh, uh, How much time? Till the bond market makes that reaction. Um, this bond market is totally artificial. It's medicated, manipulated, uh, I can't say enough words, by the central banks of the world. Half of the 10 trillion is in central banks, the Fed, China, so forth. It's sequestered. They're roach motels. The bonds go in. They never come out. That's the only way we've gotten away with this so far. But the central banks are done. The People's Printing Press of China is not buying any more bonds. The People's Printing Press of America is out of business. And as a result of that, we're going to have a test one of these days of the real bond market, of real free market investors and how silly can they be to buy a three-year bond for 30 basis points when the acknowledged inflation rate, as the Fed measures it, which is totally phony, by the way, at 2%, uh, and you're buying a five-year bond at 30 basis points, there is going to be hell to pay. And I think it's coming. I don't know when, but when it comes, this, this town isn't going to be ready to deal with it. I, I, I'm Can you close the, us out on a good note, Governor? <laughs> I, well, I, I'm going to go with the earlier stock from the 1% to 2% reduction okay. over a, a decade. It, it, it shouldn't, yeah, it's painful, but it's but it really is, to put it in perspective, I mean, yeah, it, you know, it, it can be done. And I do think the government has a, a bit to do with growth in the sense that it controls the permits that determine whether I can go forward and do something or not. And to, to that extent, until I can get them out of that role, if they've got the permits in their hands, I've got to get them. And so there's that, that interaction. I don't think we need the, 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 the public capital. I think there's, I mean, we're awash in capital, and, 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 and money is almost free today to, to put to work. Uh, let's get that going. I, I do think the chairman's idea on, on, on Simpson Bowles is, is interesting, and it would be, it would be, it would be great of great interest to me to see that that put forward. I, um, I, and I think on the tax expenditures, I had the privilege of being with the Chairman Greenspan as he and and Marty Feldstein and, some, and, and John Taylor talked a good deal about this to the Senate Finance uh, Subcommittee. And I think Simpson Bowles was clever, and and in that they got at not just the business tax rates, but they got at individual rates and. Uh, I mean, everybody can say, well, gee, I'd, I'd like to, I, I'd certainly like to, while we're at it on the business taxation, improve territoriality and, and the way that would work in, the, in a competitive way. Uh, but if you, if you gave me, if I had to start with the position where Simpson Bowles would leave me with a much lower rate, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of, I want to be in that conversation. So I, I think there's, and, and, it, and it finesses the difficulty because if you deal with individual rates, then all the non-corporate business organization structures get treated uh, appro appropriately. I mean, they, they should not have uh, as much to, uh, to be concerned about. Um, so so that's, that to me is very, would be very interesting. I'd like to see them go plus on top of that. But, mm -hmm. but uh, the, other, the other thing that's interesting about the committee, we haven't said too much about this, but it, it really is a legislative process. So my assumption is that if Congress puts it on the desk, no matter what it gets said somewhere else in town, if, if something passes the Congress, it's going to be signed. Uh, I mean, I think it would be uh, unbelievably reckless, dangerous, and I think politically destructive. And, and, and Jane made a point earlier, which, you know, in terms of, of people voting, 
You know, we always have every election, it seems like, or every every couple of elections, we, we suddenly discover a new truth that we should have seen it coming. And I'm not sure that maybe the new truth in the 2012 election is, is that uh, it, it's the, um, you know, simply retreating to the camps and waging war on the other camp may in fact be the, the old, uh, that may have been the last election strategy and it may not, it, it may not cut it in, in 12 because I think there's a, a level of, of, of anger and, and it's and it's reflected in the what, what often is called the Tea Party, but it's really the, this Tea Party movement, which is not a party, but it is a movement, and it it I think includes people who have been Republicans, who've been Democrats, who've been Independents, and they're brought together by the fact they're really irritated, they're really upset, and I think they sit in the middle and they hold a lot of sway, and it's not they're not. Uh, and it's all about, I think, some policy questions more than it is. It's not a, I don't look at that group and say there's anything that socially or such kind of really unites them. I think it's their, their irritation at government. And uh, so, so if I'm just lobbing arrows at the other guy, maybe that's the wrong place to be. Well, just to respond to that and to say something positive, I thought I would, I've been thinking about that for an hour. There must be something <laughs> I can say. Uh, but on the, the Tea Party, I, I would say the Tea Party is part of the problem, not part of the solution. Yes, it does reflect anger, but it isn't. It seems to have an ideological agenda, and it imposes litmus tests on politicians who, if they don't go along with the no tax pledge, get a primary opponent. And having had a number of primary opponents over the years, that ain't fun. And having had very tough elections, um, you learn, you grow, you grow a thicker skin, uh, you know, it's proof that you're in the middle if you get slammed from both sides. Yeah. I think the people who are really angry in this country are the people in the middle, and I think that's why there's a lot of conversation about a third party. These are people who think that, peop that, that neither parties or n neither extreme of either party is entitled to its own facts, your point of, of, about uh, Moynihan, and that's what we seem to have be operating in a fact-free universe, and these people are thoughtful, and they want facts, and they want us to actually do something. So here's my positive point. Uh, I think there are a lot of uh, smart people in Congress, in both parties, who came here for the right reasons. And they may not agree on everything. We on this panel don't agree on everything, except we do agree to go big. Um, but we want to solve this problem. And we want to try out various ways to solve this problem. I think the, this, this thoughtful group in Congress, which is fairly large, needs to be liberated and given a chance to uh, engage in legislation here, which it's not given a chance to engage. The committee process is bypassed, by and large. The leadership drafts the bills. Um, it's, it's a war of press releases rather than a serious, thoughtful uh, effort to solve a big, huge problem. Uh, my idea about Simpson-Bowles is, yes, it should be considered. I wouldn't do the up or down vote now. I think everyone will run away but I would introduce it on a separate track through the committee process and try to help the people in Congress, in both houses, who really have thoughtful things to say, uh, understand it and, and try it out on their own constituents. I actually think we could pass not it necessarily, but something like it. The baskets that it contains are the right baskets, whether these precise prescriptions are right or not, and give Congress a chance to be good. And so that's my hopeful thought. Congress okay. has good people who could be good if given a chance. Well, with three and a half hours of fiscal policy and public policy today, I'm going to just say one closing word of thanks. Um, I mean, I think we heard so much today about how real the problem is, how large the problem is. And one of the things that we focus a little bit more on is sort of the dangers of doing nothing. Because a lot of times in this town, the focus has been, well, I don't want to do that, you know, retirement age or means testing or taxes. But instead, if you think a little bit more about the cost of doing nothing, which we heard from so many different voices today, it's an incredibly powerful argument for why we need to act. And I thought what Chairman Greenspan said was incredibly important as well, which is if you're not going to get your first choice, it's not really an excuse to walk away from the table. We need to find a compromise that's going to get this done. So with all these truly remarkable voices today talking about this, what, what I guess I hope is that all these voices will come out of the shadows and that in the coming months we will be hearing over and over again this support for the super committee. And uh, the message from this panel in particular was not even go big or, or go really, really big, but somewhere along those lines in that spectrum, um, I think that we can 
urge them, support them, and hopefully come up with a real resolution to this problem. And it was great to hear so much about Bull Simpson in particular, which was a remarkable, remarkable piece of work which I think changed the discussion in this country, and perhaps that can serve as a really important liftoff point for this discussion to go forward. So thank you so much to all the panelists, and thank you to our co-moderator, Peter Cook.